hi everyone. Uh, we've been thinking about DNA synthesis screening for the last few months, and we're particularly glad to have had the help of Lolita Sundaram at CESAR and Becky Michael Crane at the Engineering Biology Research Consortium. Uh, it's been great working together. Uh, the rough problem we're worried about is that malicious actors will synthesize DNA uh, from commercial providers, use that to create a bioweapon, and then uh, deploy that bioweapon to cause a global catastrophic biological risk, uh, GCBR. So we'll first talk about why we're motivated to work on this, why this uh, could be important. Uh, then we'll uh, discuss what we've actually done to investigate this, some of the things we've found, uh, what we've written, and also what's uh, still left to do. So here's uh, a rough, somewhat simplified outline of how things could go quite wrong. So in the uh, top left here, we have a malicious actor, perhaps someone who wants to kill lots of people using biology. They gain access to sequence information of uh, one or more dangerous pathogens. This is generally freely available online, so isn't that hard to uh, get. Then they can send an order to a commercial DNA synthesis company to print out that DNA for them uh, and mail it back. Once they have this physical DNA molecule, they can then go on to uh, use their laboratory skills to actually create a live infectious bioweapon. Then they may go on to deploy that bioweapon to cause a GCBR. So this is clearly very bad. We want to prevent this. Thankfully, there's uh, several places we can intervene to uh, make sure this doesn't happen. So, uh, for instance, intelligence agencies could have great surveillance, uh, re Catherine's talk before, uh, and make sure that all the malicious actors are uh, kept tabs on well, and we can prevent them from doing anything nasty before it happens. We could also try to take down the digital sequence information uh, from the web. This seems like a good thing to do, but uh, is uh, very difficult to actually fully remove something from the internet once it's there. The step we've chosen to focus on is here uh, of the conversion of the digital sequence information into a physical DNA molecule. This is perhaps easier to target because there's maybe a few dozen companies around the world who uh, provide this commercial synthesis service. And so that's a uh, somewhat smaller set of agents who uh, if we can get them to screen properly, then this would put a significant dent in this problem. You could also work later uh, in the steps of creating the bioweapon to make sure that uh, these skills remain difficult and that only a small number of relatively trained people can do this. Uh, you could also work uh, even later trying to prevent the conversion of a bioweapon into a GCBR. So things like vaccines, great PPE, good early warning systems all help for this. Also good to note that uh, we are mainly thinking about uh, small groups of actors who are relatively unsophisticated, because uh, if you're, say, a government or a large corporation, you'll probably be able to synth synthesize your own uh, DNA regardless uh, without going via a commercial company. So the small actors are more impacted by this intervention. So a few of the things we've done. Uh, we haven't done a formal uh, systematic review, but we've read most of the literature that uh, seemed relevant and contacted a lot of the authors there, and many of them were nice enough to uh, agree to talk to us, so that's been really useful too. Yeah, so that's one of our findings. Um, first, the technical stuff. Um, there are roughly three main ways of doing um, synthesis screening. First one is list-based or last best match. Second is list-based with functional prediction added on it. And the third one is secure DNA's approach. Um, List-based screening, um, fairly straightforward. Um, you take um, the ordered sequence and using last, um, which is um, um, yeah, a method of looking up big databases. Um, using last, you um, run your sequence against a big database of all sequences of concern. You look at your best matches um, and determine whether um, the sequence is a sequence of concern. Um, there are a number of issues with this. Um, these big data databases um, contain loads of sequences that have some engineered tags on them. And these engineered tags, um, if they are present in the DNA order, they can 
um, give false matches, so false positives. Um, there are other ways of um, getting false positives. Um, another one is that um, your sequence is, or the ordered sequence is from a dangerous pathogen, but it doesn't have a dangerous function. Um, these sequences should be um, allowed to be printed and used, um, but they would come up as flags. Um, yeah. Um, so because of these false positives and high false positive rates, um, there is need for secondary screening um, by a bioinformatician. Um, this takes time, and the time of bioinformaticians is really valuable, so it also costs money uh, for DNA providers. Um, so yeah, this is why some research groups um, tried to develop good functional prediction um, as an add-on to these um, these based approaches. Um, one of them is six screen. This was the first one. They are particularly important because um, they made their tool open source, so other research groups can also work um, on it. So it's good. Um, the most recent tool and what's like quite promising is NTI's common mechanism that is um, partially uh, built on the six screen tool. Um, so this is good. Um, but yeah, uh, they're basically um, also just using um, loads of different lists to screen against. And as an add-on, they have uh, functions or sequences of concern database. Um, this is, that's like mid table there. Oh, I should use my thing. Uh, yeah, that one. Um, and this is good because it provides some background information for um, secondary screening and so uh, takes off from secondary screening time. Um, still, um, these databases, they are, um, yeah, collated um, through ensemble machine learning tools that are trained on um, data from just annotated sequences. Uh, there's not really enough data for these tools to be really, really great. Um, but yeah, if they were, uh, or um, if they can be improved, that would be great because um, if the false positive rates are low enough, then you can just emit your secondary screener um, and just, yeah, uh, relay all suspicious orders to an intelligence agency who can then um, build profiles of um, suspicious activity. Um, and if enough flags come up, they can intervene. Okay, so uh, another group working on this is Secure DNA over at MIT in the US. Uh, one of their key goals is uh, to avert information hazards. So a important worry is that we collate a database of sequences of concern, all the things that we're most worried about if someone uh, gets hold of and uses for malicious reasons. Secure DNA is concerned that uh, once we have this database, we would probably need to give it to lots of governments because they might be involved in creating it or uh, need to use it. We would also need to give it to all the synthesis companies so that they can actually uh, do the screening. This uh, is quite a concern because perhaps some governments are secretly running bioweapons programs, uh, perhaps some companies will be hacked uh, and the data stolen, or uh, perhaps some companies are just secretly malicious. So Secure DNA is worried about this. Instead, uh, they use a, uh, an encrypted approach where the database is stored as these hashed sequences that are undecipherable and unintelligible to anyone uh, who gains access to them. So this uh, means you can uh, store the database in a safe way, uh, and even if mm, someone hacks you, it's not so bad. The other key goal of theirs is to uh, avoid the human element of screening and allow uh, us to screen in a fully automatic way. So they do this by pre-computing a very large database of uh, all the functional variants of the sequences of concern. So for instance, uh, just a few mutations in a DNA sequence will often not change the function of that sequence. And so we should still be very concerned if someone takes a dangerous sequence, makes a few small tweaks, and then orders that. And so secure DNA just uh, has taken the approach of adding all of these functional variants to a database. And then when someone makes an order, they will simply look up, uh, is this order in our big database? And if it is, we won't let you print it. So uh, this, means 
as Hannah was saying, we don't need to pay the bioinformaticians, and so this is faster and cheaper. And also, as the synthesis industry grows, uh, it will probably become less sustainable to keep on having humans as involved. So this is good uh, looking forward as well. So it's great that we have these technical screening tools uh, at our disposal, but of course, it's not very useful unless we actually implement them, particularly uh, even if some companies do great screening, uh, that's not so useful if not everyone does, because a malicious actor might just go to the company that they know does uh, the worst screening or no screening at all even. So this is where uh, regulation, particularly by governments, is uh, of special importance. So the US is uh, probably the most advanced on this front. Uh, way back in 2010, uh, the federal government there released a guidance on DNA synthesis screening. And uh, this was helpful. Uh, many companies have complied and uh, now do uh, have moderately good screening practices. But sadly, this is optional and many companies just uh, essentially ignored it as well. So uh, that's not comprehensive. California did try to go further uh, and actually mandate that all companies in their state need to screen properly. But this was uh, vetoed by the governor, unfortunately. And the new version they're trying is a lot less comprehensive uh, because it only targets university-based researchers. We've also uh, heard earlier uh, about the IGSC and their, this industry group, the International Gene Synthesis Consortium, uh, who uh, are composed of members who do screen and are encouraging others to screen. So this is great, but also not comprehensive and not binding. The Biological Weapons Convention uh, is the international uh, governance agreement in this space, but it was written about 50 years ago and doesn't uh, say anything about DNA synthesis. Also, there just isn't a, a good verification mechanism, and so it's hard to tell. Uh, perhaps some companies uh, do have bioweapons programs that we wouldn't know about. So that uh, doesn't work uh, too well in this case either. Yeah, another um, regulatory attempt um, that I'm quite excited about is just expert, expert controls in general. Um, these are usually, um, or yeah, these are um, statewide regulations, but there are some um, interstate um, yeah, commitments and there's some collaboration, but this specific quote, um, we put it up because it's like quite bad. Uh, this is trying to regulate um, um, smaller um, synthesis machines like the one uh, up there um, and um, less than gene length sequences because bigger machines and bigger sequences um, are regulated anyway. Um, but this basically, the literally reading of this um, uh, means that if you don't screen, that mm, you're not liable. This is not um, what we want from uh, synthesis companies. Um, so yeah, this would be an easy thing to change. Um, we did email the UK expert control um, people. Um, yeah, maybe they'll get back to us. Um, but yeah, just changing this um, to, um, if you would have reasonably suspected that your sequence would be used to make a biological weapon, then this would actually be an impactful uh, export control. Um, yeah, uh, after all of this um, technical, um, after all these technical findings and uh, regulatory attempts, we um, wrote up our own recommendations. This figure is from our policy brief. Um, I'll quickly walk through um, the actors and their um, proposed roles. Um, so we have the government um, um, here, it's the UK government, um, and it was that uh, they should provide free or um, very cheap screening software, partnering with um, people who develop these to um, DNA advanced shop equipment providers who should be doing um, screening of both customers and sequences and keep records um, so that they can report suspicious activity back to the intelligence agency. Um, governments should also um, um, figure out um, funding criteria and guidance for um, non-government founders and journals on um, what uh, screening guidance or what screening recommendations they should um, um, put up on their sites so that the customers can um, comply. And customers should be keeping records of uh, DNA and equipment exchange between each other, um, again, um, so that um, 
we can track back uh, suspicious activity. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, one of our outputs is a policy brief for the UK government. Uh, we started distributing this to policymakers and think tanks, um, but yeah, we'll continue doing this this week. Um, it's basically done. Um, we also submitted a policy memo to the Journal of Science and Policy, Science Policy and Governance. Um, this is um, US federal government focused because uh, that was the prompt. Um, yeah, we're waiting to hear back from them. Um, and we're also working on a review paper with Dalita um, on the different screening methods. Um, and we'll continue working on this after Gary finishes. Um, yeah, probably our like most tangible, or like maybe biggest fact so far. Um, we got the Royal Society to put up um, a section on biosecurity and especially, um, or specifically on DNA synthesis screening into their um, research ethics, animal treatment, and now biosecurity page. Um, this is basically word to word, but we sent them in an email. It's kind of cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, as I said, future work uh, for us is to finish the review paper. Um, and we're hoping that our policy brief will continue to circulate and actually have some impact on government legislation. Um, the last one is completely out of our control, but we're really excited for NTI and Secure DNA to uh, actually launch their tools. Um, NTI is coming very soon, um, in a couple of months, and uh, Secure DNA is sold in roughly two years. That's what we heard. Um, and it would also be good if these two um, would combine in a couple of years at least um, because they are complementary and we think this is how we get uh, best winning coverage. Um, yeah, this is our two-line summary. Um, DNA synthesis screening does reduce the risk of um, DCBRs and so governments um, should care about this. <laughs>